planning, and I think we have an exciting time today. We will have an exciting time, so uh, let's talk about what we're going to do today. So uh, I'll do a brief introduction uh, on stem cells and autoimmune diseases, and I'll talk briefly about obviously Lyme uh, and uh, stem cells and autoimmune diseases. And then uh, Dr. Duncan Ross was here. So somewhere up here. So uh, he's a pioneer uh, who actually uh, did a favor for us. So uh, he'll talk about uh, basic research in exosomes and uh, how exosomes can be used in various fields of medicine. So this is Dr. Duncan Ross. Hi, everyone. So uh, let's talk about stem cells in general. So, uh, what is stem cell? So, it's a single cell that can replicate itself or be differentiated into many, many cell types. So, uh, all our cells in our body, the whole body comes from a single stem cell. And uh, basically, in my practice, I found that there's a lot of confusion because when people talk about stem cell therapy, they talk about different, different things. And today, one of the points of the presentation, I want to we are kind of you know, in order. So uh, when we're talking about stem cells, we're talking about four different things. So the so-called hematopoietic stem cell therapy, uh, which typically used in oncology, but also can be used in rheumatology. There is a mesenchymal stem cell therapy, uh, embryonic stem cell therapy, and uh, exosome or mesenchymal stem cell derived exosome therapy. And so these are different therapies, and we'll briefly talk about the each of them. So, uh, hematopoietic stem cell therapy is a therapy which basically focused on hematopoietic stem cells. So, these cells they give rise to all blood cell types, including lymphocytes, neutrophils, uh, platelets, uh, macrophages, and so on and so on. So, this is the oldest form of stem cell therapy. And uh, this is the most brutal form of stem cell, cell therapy. So how does it work? So uh, there are four stages. Uh, so first of all, uh, patients uh, are treated with the drugs which mobilize stem cell uh, to move from bone marrow into the bloodstream. So that after mobilization, uh, stem cells are harvested using specific technique. And after that, patients go on chemotherapy to wipe out their own stem cells, which are still in the body. So once, the cell, uh, once uh, uh, basically the residual stem cells are wiped out, and the, the chemotherapy also wiped out the whole immune system. So then the new stem cells are introduced, and uh, you basically start recovering. So this is a brutal therapy, but this is the first therapy which became available uh, for various, various reasons, mainly hematology and oncology, but uh, approximately uh, 30 years ago, uh, the first treatment with the hematopoietic stem cell was introduced in a patient with uh, actually rheumatoid arthritis, uh, and it was in 1996. So uh, <coughs> this patient had so called mixed connective tissue disease, had rheumatoid arthritis, had lupus like presentation, and pulmonary hypertension. And uh, he was denied a blood transplantation, so there was nothing left. And so he was like a guinea pig, honestly speaking. And uh, he underwent through uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation protocol, and the protocol existed for lymphoma patients for years and years and years prior to that. And uh, he survived. Uh, he survived for 15 years and then died from infection. And so right now, if you look at uh, a registry, and uh, I couldn't find any registry in the United States, but there's European registry. So there are approximately 2,000 patients who underwent uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. And so there are only right now uh, two main indications. So one is a light reddening scleroderma or systemic sclerosis, and second is a catastrophic lupus. So uh, basically, hematopoietic stem cells were tried in other conditions, and results were very poor. Uh, as far as I know, this type of therapy never been tried in patients with chronic Lyme disease for a number of reasons. So, and again, it's a brutal therapy. So we're not doing that in our clinic. 
Yes. Why would you do a phoresis instead of just doing a bone marrow harvest or something like that? Well, because you can harvest much, much more cells. So you basically stimulate cells. So you're using uh, various growth factor or cyclophosphamide. So you do mobilization. So you're getting more than, say, 60 cc's of feedback. Oh, much more. Okay. But what kind of factor? Uh, so typically in clean they use uh, GSF, a ground stimulating factor, or uh, more frequent cyclop. You know, how much of a factor difference or you be back? Uh, I would say thousand X. Thousand times? Yeah. Wow. Okay. okay. So because your basic blood can be off the different of, your blood is loaded with the stem cell after treatment. Right. right. And there's a big time when it's the best time for harvesting. So, uh, but again, we're talking about not missing time, but motivated stem cells specifically, right? Okay. And so right now, uh, this therapy is uh, available in Europe, and uh, as far as I understand, uh, it's also available uh, in certain NIH institutions for patients who have catastrophic forward immune illnesses, specifically for patients who have uh, lupus, uh, which is resistant to everything else, and scleroderma. So, uh, as far as I know, uh, basically survival rate is not the greatest one, and again, if you look like the life expectancy after the type of therapy is not the greatest one as well, but again, we're talking about patients who have very shrink up very small life expectancy to start with, so uh, again, for them, it's a reasonable therapy. So uh, the next uh, therapy, which is much more popular in this stage, is mesenchymal stem cell therapy. And so the person who discovered mesenchymal stem cells was my teacher, actually back in Russia. I almost finished doing PhD under his uh, guidance. So he passed away in 1997, and uh, he is the first person who discovered the stem cells back in Moscow in the 60s. So. Uh, in contrast to terminovatic stem cells, uh, mesenchymal cell, cell cells, they actually work in a different way. So uh, they actually can be transformed into epithelial cells, stem, epithelial cells neurons, uh, connect tissue cells like fibroblasts, cartilage cells, bone cells, muscle cells, and so on and so on. So, uh, and that's the therapy which is uh, right now probably is the most popular therapy in the whole <coughs> area. For a number of reasons. So, uh, first of all, it's easy to harvest uh, mesenchymal stem cells. You can harvest them from either bone marrow or fat tissue. So, uh, and there are a lot of misunderstandings. So, mesenchymal stem cells, they don't replace diseased tissues. So, what they do, they kind of feed your immune system. So, they have trophic, uh, anti inflammatory, and regenerative effects. So, uh, again, they don't replace the disease tissue, but again, they kind of, they have so called bystander uh, attack. So, uh, right now, uh, all clinical trials uh, which require the time of stem cell use, they're registered through uh, NIH, and so you can find them on, uh, publicly on the NIH website. So, when I looked last time, there were 18 trials for diabetes. 11 trials for Crohn's disease and colitis, 7 trials for MS, multiple sclerosis, uh, 3 trials for ALS, uh, 1 for Chopin syndrome, 1 for RA, uh, 1 for scleroderma, and 3 trials for lupus. So again, overall there are like 200 different trials right now. Uh, most of the trials actually which I found were not for all the immune diseases, but mainly for stroke, uh, concussion, sport injuries, uh, and also uh, common artery disease. Yeah. Is it bone marrow or fat? Uh, both yeah. actually yeah. fat and bone marrow. Both. So they don't discriminate between the sources of the mesenchymal stem cells. So, uh, and again, if you look at the NIH statement, so the statement tells you that the results are positive but not altogether consistent. That's what they're talking about. And again, uh, it's just a slide, it's a bit technical slide, but I want to show you in general what's the current thinking about uh, as a common stem cells. So they both so-called bystander effect. So for example, if you infuse those cells in patients with a stroke or MS, so these cells are not going to fix the problem, they're not going to regenerate the tissue, but 
They're going to suppress an autoimmune response and they're going to feed neurons and various other cells within the brain. So this is so-called trophic attack, and that's how these cells will work. So uh, let's talk about uh, what are the limitations. So the limitations are uh, how many cells we can get. Uh, because uh, apparently in the United States, we cannot expand uh, kind of stem cells and then put them back in human body. So it's prohibited so far, as far as I know. And uh, maybe there's some new data, but as of six months ago, uh, I couldn't find any single lab which is a lot of expand in the kind of stem cell for human use. That's number one. So second, uh, it's it's a procedure which uh, basically requires either one male operation or liposuction. Uh, and then you can do it once or twice or several times, but again, you need a continuous treatment. So this is not very efficient for continuous therapy. So you're limited in terms of how many cells you can get. And that's the main limitation. The second limitation, which is more relevant to our area, the area of uh, all immune disease and chronic infections, is that there are more and more data indicating that a lot of uh, infectious agents, for example, Borrelia, Bartonella, Mycoplasma, Chlamydia, that they do persist within the stem cell. And so then by uh, actually doing mesenchymal stem cell transplantation, uh, you open the jar with worms, because basically it's spread infection. And again, uh, that's something which I'm not very comfortable with. So the next approach uh, based on uh, human embryonic stem cells. And again, the way how it works, so uh, there is uh, IVF, which is done in vitro, so sperm and eggs are harvested and uh, fertilization is performed in vitro, then the embryo develops for five, seven days, and then cells isolate from the embryo. So uh, these cells are different from mesenchymal stem cells or hematopoietic stem cells because they can give rise to any cell in the body. So it, apparently these step, uh, embryonic stem cells can repair any defect. So, and you think that it's ideal therapy, but there's some limitations. Uh, again, uh, this is a picture showing that uh, these are really, really kind of unique stem cells because they can repair almost everything. But... Uh, uh, so let me kind of go back and force and So uh, the problem is uh, that uh, our body is not protected against embryonic stem cells and uh, there's very high risk of uh, induction of tumors down the road. And so right now it's a very debatable issue if you treat a condition uh, currently and let's say 10 years down the road you develop a tumor. So how ethical is it? The whole issue is, and so it's a very debatable issue right now. So uh, right now, the main epicenter of uh, embryonic stem cell therapy is India. So India has the highest rate of embryonic cell stem, stem cell transplantation, and most of the case reports which I found they come from India. So uh, there are cases uh, where uh, these embryonic stem cells were used for Lyme disease. Uh, there are cases uh, embryonic stem cells were used for MS. There are cases of uh, embryonic stem cell use for Parkinson's and so on and so on. The list is huge. Again, the data is uh, only for like five or six years follow up. There's not a long term data at all. So, but short term data looks great. So, if you compare uh, embryonic cell versus adult stem cell, so what's the difference? Again, embryonic stem cells can be differentiated uh, in any cell type. Uh, you can get as many stem cells as you want. Uh, again, it's a foreign product, so your body can cause immune rejection. Again, uh, these cells can uh, cause tumor formation, and that's the main kind of promising point and desirable side effect. And there are some ethical issues about using embryonic stem cells in humans. So, uh, compared to mesenchymal stem cells, so uh, we're limited to also how many stem cells we can get from our own body. And uh, again, uh, less moral issues, less likely to form tumors, but at the same time, you can spread infection. So, it's kind of it's a catch 22. And uh, I've been working on the topic of stem cells for autoimmune diseases and chronic infections for a number of years, and I couldn't kind of make a decision which way to go until. 
I found exosomes. And uh, so, uh, and I think that exosomes better than stem cells. That's my personal kind of opinion. Again, uh, you can argue about that and you can ask Dr. Duncan Ross questions about that, but I think that's the future. So, uh, these are tiny vesicles which are produced by cells, and so it's almost like a shuttle which different cells use to communicate with each other. And uh, again, uh, we can isolate uh, exosomes from these enchymal stem cells, and these exosomes actually uh, they have all the activities of uh, enchymal stem cells. So, uh, and they can be used to treat various autoimmune diseases and uh, chronic infections. So uh, we're not going to talk about that. And so if you look at publications, so there are clusters of publications about exosomes. So exosomes in Europe right now are used for asthma and allergy. And actually, I found that in a couple of countries, uh, there are more and more data in European countries generated on use of exosomes for patients who have COPD. So uh, there's a data on exosomes for lupus. So uh, there's a data on exosomes uh, in patients with MS, uh, and uh, there's a new kind of avenue uh, using exosomes to treat rheumatoid arthritis. So these are all very exciting things. And uh, again, right now there are kind of clusters of different applications. So uh, uh, yeah, definitely, definitely exosomes can be used to treat various uh, neurological conditions such as MS. Uh, Parkinson's disease, early dementia, uh, there are a couple of articles actually focused on uh, chronic kidney diseases and exosomes, uh, as well as chronic liver diseases, and uh, also if they're using exosomes to treat uh, coronary artery disease, uh, strokes, and so on and so on. So uh, let's switch the topic for a few minutes and talk about uh, Lyme disease. So why exosomes and other stem cells can be used to treat Lyme disease? Uh, from my standpoint, uh, Lyme disease and all different diseases uh, are not separate, so it's the same thing. So, because uh, if you look at the whole idea of philosophy behind all different diseases, so uh, in order to develop an all different disease, you have, uh, you have to have an appropriate genetic background and you have to have an infectious agent which triggers the disease. And then it's just a matter of luck what you're going to develop. So if you look at Lyme disease and you look at official publications on Lyme, so you can find that Lyme disease can trigger rheumatoid arthritis, chronic fatigue syndrome, <coughs> scleroderma, fibromyalgia, premature dementia, uh, alopecia, and we see all these conditions in our clinic, as well as various neurological problems like autoimmune encephalopathy, autoimmune pericarditis, uh, traumatic kidney purpura, and again, the list can be continued and continued and continued. Uh, probably right now in my library, I have over different conditions which can be treated by Lyme disease. But again, if you don't check for Lyme, if you accept that these are all autoimmune diseases, then why cannot use uh, stem cells or exosomes to treat them? So logically, so completely justifiable. And again, uh, these are just uh, a couple of recent publications about Lyme and autoimmunity. So uh, again, uh, the list of publications is probably a couple of thousand right now. So stem cells and Lyme, they became very popular a few years ago when one of the celebrities, Rwanda Foster, officially uh, announced that uh, she benefited uh, from stem cells more than from anything else. And again, the whole kind of uh, talk about stem cells started after that. And so uh, basically what she got, she got missing common stem cells which were obtained uh, after liposuction. So she had a couple of uh, therapies done, and apparently uh, uh, that the therapy induced uh, some strong <coughs> remission. And right now, if you go on the internet, you can find uh, different you know, talks about Lyme disease and stem cell treatment. Although, if you're trying to get some results, uh, you don't. You don't have anything, because there are not many publications. So I went to different databases, and I failed to find something specific. So the only publication which I was able to find is publication again coming from India, uh, from Mumbai, and uh, again uh, this particular uh, center in Mumbai they're using uh, embryonic stem cells. 
So, um, uh, again, why uh, I have preference in exosomes? So, uh, first of all, exosomes versus stem cells. So, exosomes provide the uh, same or even stronger beneficial effect on uh, abnormal immune system compared to mesenchymal stem cells. Uh, they don't proliferate, and they're not associated with the risk of malignancies down the road. Uh, compared to stem cells, exosomes actually have one very important property. They do penetrate through uh, barrier tissues, and they do penetrate through blood-brain barrier. So they're much more efficient in treatment patients with various neurological problems. Uh, so they can be used repetitively with no major risk for serious side effects. Uh, again, uh, when we're harvesting uh, stem cells, there's always a risk of spreading infection. So exosomes apparently don't assess that risk, and because of that, they're much, much safer. So, uh, and uh, actually, uh, the biological information which you can deliver through exosomes is exactly the same which you can deliver actually from stem cells. So, saying that, I would like to invite Dr. Ross, who will be specifically on exosomes. Dr. Ross? Yes. Uh, 